Hello everyone. Now we are on the subject of biotechnology, which is a very broad subject. Uh, some of the purposes for biotechnology is using the latest advances in technology to learn about, modify, and use biological systems within organisms or the living organisms themselves to create products that will be useful in medicine and human health, agriculture, the non-food use of agricultural products, such as making biofuels or uh, biodegradable plastics, etc., and also environmental applications. Uh, the modern usage includes DNA analysis and genome sequencing, assisted reproductive technologies, and of course, pre-implantation genetic analysis. Both of these were discussed in a previous PowerPoint. And then gene cloning and gene therapy, um, a, a field called pharmacogenomics, advanced techniques for domestication of animals and cultivation of plants. Remember, breeding has been going on for generations, uh, but now, uh, this uh, domestication and cultivation uh, can be happening through artificial selection, hybridization, cloning plants and animals, and genetic manipulation of plants and animals. And then number seven, we have cell and tissue culture technology. So this is, all of these um, subjects are pretty broad even within themselves, but the, the following slides I'd like to go through um, these other than the reproductive technologies to give you an idea of what ha is happening in biotechnology today. Uh, first of all, this is kind of interesting. If you take a look at Wikipedia, uh, what we can consider genetic manipulation, it's actually been going on for thousands of years. Um, they have CE as common era and then BCE is before the Common Era, and Common Era um, used to be called AD, um, referring to the birth of Christ, but now the terms before Common Era, BCE, um, you can see these were thousands of years ago, 7,000 years ago BCE, also um, called BC. Chinese discover fermentation through beer making, once you know it, one of the first to uh, products that was made using um, fermentation and, and studying uh, systems in living organisms, such as yeast, etc., to make alcoholic beverages. Uh, uh, 6,000 BCE yogurt and cheese have, uh, were made using lactic acid producing bacteria. And then 4,000 BCE, the Egyptians were baking bread that was leavened using yeast. 500 BCE, moldy soybean curds used, uh, were used as an antibiotic. Um, and also the ancient Greeks practiced crop rotation for maximum soil fertility. And uh, 100 years uh, CE, 100 years uh, after the birth of Christ, which is now called the Common Era, the Chinese were actually using chrysanthemum as a natural insecticide. Then we have, uh, this is split up before the 20th century, uh, before the 1900s, you have uh, the discovery of cells, etc. And you can go through all of these um, discoveries on your own. But in the 20th century, there was a lot going on as well. It really was in the 1980s that we saw some um, genetic uh, invest, you know, investigation into DNA and the ability to actually um, identify people through DNA analysis. Um, and this was actually starting in the 1980s. It was in the 80s that was the first time where a serial killer was convicted using DNA evidence. And then in the year 2000, which is what we talked about um, when we looked at the uh, Human Genome Project uh, PowerPoint just before this, uh, the Human Genome Project um, actually achieved a, a complete rough draft of the human genome. And of course, now is the 21st century, and we've got all kinds of things happening today.
even genetic manipulation. So um, some of the highlights in DNA and genome-related analysis and manipulation include sequencing the human genome, DNA fingerprinting and restriction fragment length polymorphism, which is a long phrase, and they use RIFLIP for short, RFLP. I'm going to take a look at that. Polymerase chain reaction, which is actually amplifying a teeny little part of DNA in a DNA sample. Gene cloning, recombinant DNA and gene therapy, and genetic engineering using this powerful new tool called CRISPR and genome editing, and also creating transgenic crops. So one of the first lab activities, actually we do this in, uh, in the lab courses, is actually isolating DNA. And I wanted to show you this website. This is an amazing website for biotechnology, and also uh, they have a lot of bioethics um, activities and courses there as well. But you can actually isolate DNA from strawberries or kiwi or wheat germ. And if you're interested, you can take a look at how to do this at home with some food that's high in DNA. And most foods have DNA in them of the cells, either animal or fruits and vegetables. Typically, we use fruits and vegetables to obtain the DNA by processing the um, cells and then uh, allowing the DNA to come out of solution. So that's one of the first um, and least difficult technologically um, technique that you can use to actually look at this gooey stuff, which they have uh, analyzed it and they know that it's DNA. Then there's also DNA analysis and genome sequencing and um, this was already shown, that video that was shown during the Human Genome Project, the last PowerPoint. Oops. And then we have DNA fingerprinting, or RIFLIP. Now this is, again, this is an activity that we do in lab classes here at MCC. DNA is going to be extracted from stains, say, at the a crime scene, or body fluids, and it can actually be obtained and that uh, put into a, a test tube, the sample of DNA, that it will, the DNA will be cut up to give fragments. And then the fragments are actually placed on a gel, elect, we call it an electrophoresis gel, where there's a negative charge on one side and a positive charge on the other. DNA is actually negatively charged. And if you remember, opposites attract. And so the smaller the fragment side, the more quickly it's going to be pulled through the gel. This is a, a one minute video that I'd like to show Restriction you. enzymes recognize very specific sequences of nucleotides in DNA. DNAs from different individuals rarely have exactly the same array of restriction sites and distances between these sites. Therefore, the population is said to be polymorphic having many forms for these restriction fragment patterns. These differences are referred to as restriction fragment length polymorphisms, RFLPs. Such differences may arise through mutations. By cutting a DNA sample with a particular restriction enzyme, DNA fragments of different length are obtained. These fragments are separated by gel electrophoresis. This provides a pattern of bands that is unique for the particular DNA being analyzed. These DNA fingerprints are used in forensic science during criminal investigations. RFLPs are also useful as markers to identify particular groups of people at risk for certain genetic disorders. Okay, so this is, show, is explaining um, what RIFLIP is. Uh, restriction fragment is a length of DNA that is cut up by, they call them molecular scissors or restriction enzymes. And they're actually a, a product from a bacterium that, that these enzymes were designed to protect the bacterium from a virus infection. So when that viral DNA is shot into the bacterium, these little restriction enzymes will come out like little scissors and they identify a, a certain sequence, a, a specific sequence, each restriction enzyme has a different sequence that it recognizes, but it will recognize that and cut it. 
uh, at that site. So if you think of the DNA as a big long strand of nucleotides, which is what it is, um, each individual's uh, arrangement of, of these nucleotides is a little bit different. So you can actually compare one DNA to another DNA sample. Uh, so one person's DNA to the, another person's DNA. Now, because it's often difficult to get a large enough sample in order to test that DNA, uh, scientists developed this method called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And what that does is it can take one little teeny sample of DNA, put it into the laboratory, and along with some enzymes and some free nucleotides, and it can actually force a strand of DNA to make many, many, many copies of itself. It will actually, first you have to add these little primers, so it's going to say where um, to start and where to stop copying a segment of DNA. And then the enzymes are going to um, be able to copy um, many, many times that little length of DNA. So you get enough to actually test it. Gene cloning is when uh, Scientists use a genetically engineered bacterium to produce human protein. So the bacteria can be genetically engineered to produce a human protein, such as a cytokine. A cytokine is just a small protein that helps fight infections. Uh, the technique can also be used to make other human proteins, such as insulin, which will treat diabetes mellitus. So this is showing in, in the process of making a cytokine. Here you have a cytokine producing cell and you take a DNA strand from the cytokine producing cell and then you take a plasmid which is just a little ring of DNA from a bacterium and then you will uh, take these two put them together the cytokine gene is actually going to be cut out from this DNA the plasmid will be cut open, and then the cytokine gene can be spliced right into the plasmid. Splicing is what they used to do with film, so you can cut it, uh, cut a big strand apart, and then insert a different section. So that's what scientists can do with this uh, healthy gene that says how to make cytokine, and then that will be cut out of the DNA. The plasmid from a bacterium is cut open, and then that gene is just stuck right in there. Now this plasmid could be put back into the bacterium. The bacterium will multiply so now you have thousands and thousands of bacteria that are making human cytokine. Recombinant DNA. This is when you take uh, one DNA source and you actually add a gene or recombine that DNA in one way or another. So recombinant DNA, here's an example where you take a human cell, there's the DNA in the nucleus, and you can take out the insulin gene, isolate that insulin gene using real special techniques. Then just like with that cytokine gene in the previous slide, you take a plasmid from a bacterium, you cut it open, and you take this insulin producing gene, splice it into that plasmid. This is actually called recombinant DNA. So actually the example in the prior slide is also called recombinant DNA, um, but it, it's also called gene cloning because you're making many, many, many copies of this gene once you insert the plasmid back into the bacterium, and we can call this bacterium now transgenic because it has a new gene in one of its loops of, of DNA called the plasmid. So this plasmid now has the gene contain, that will code how to make insulin and then you're going to cause those bacteria to multiply many 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 times and now they have the ability to secrete human insulin. So that human insulin will be purified and packaged and it can be used to treat people with um, diabetes mellitus. Uh, genetic engineering via CRISPR. This is the latest, the, the hottest tool in genetic engineering. And it's called CRISPR because it means clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. So I'm not going to expect you to memorize this phrase, but be familiar with CRISPR. 
Um, the CRISPR um, are actually CRISPRs are segments of bacterial DNA that when paired with a specific guide protein, such as a protein called CASR, um, that's CRISPR associated protein 9, CAS, this tool can be used to make targeted cuts in an organism's genome. Um, this is a short video that actually explains a little bit to you. In a document, if we suspect we've misspelled a word, we can use the find function to highlight the error and correct it or delete it. Within our DNA, that function is taken on by a system called CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR is short for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. CRISPR consists of two components, the Cas9 protein that can cut DNA and a guide RNA that can recognize the sequence of DNA to be edited. To use CRISPR-Cas9, scientists first identify the sequence of the human genome that's causing a health problem. Then they create a specific guide RNA to recognize that particular stretch of A's, T's, G's, and C's in the DNA. The guide RNA is attached to the DNA cutting enzyme Cas9, and then this complex is introduced to the target cells. It locates the target letter sequence and cuts the DNA. At that point, scientists can then edit the existing genome by either modifying, deleting, or inserting new sequences. It effectively makes CRISPR-Cas9 a cut and paste tool for DNA editing. In the future, scientists hope to use CRISPR-Cas9 to develop critical advances in patient care or even cure lifelong inherited diseases. Pretty amazing. So... In a document, if we suspect we've misspelled a word That is CRISPR. This is another video, it's quite long, but if you're really interested in, in gene editing or you wanted to do a paper about that, um, there's some really good videos, videos out there. And this one's from MIT, and it really goes into some detailed explanation. Um, and here's a couple of figures that also illustrate CRISPR. Um, and it's showing how DNA can be edited using this technique so the scientists create a genetic sequence. They call it a guide RNA. It matches a piece of DNA, um, the, the faulty DNA that they want to modify. Then the, they add that sequence to a cell along with a, that Cas9 protein. And this actually acts like a pair of scissors that cuts DNA in that specific region. The guide RNA will hone in on that target DNA and now and that's where the Cas9 knows how to cut it out. Once their job's complete, the guide RNA and the Cas9 will leave the scene and then another piece of DNA could be swapped into place of the old DNA and then there's an enzyme which will repair the cuts. Voila, you've edited the DNA. Another thing that scientists are doing is creating transgenic crops um, via genetic engineering. So there is a couple of videos here. This one is actually quite good, and I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but if you're interested in doing uh, a position paper about um, genetically modified organisms, Transgenic crops are also called genetically modified organisms, but they are specifically food crops. Uh, other organisms could be genetically modified animals, for example. But so this is actually uh, GMOs. And this is actually the case for GMOs. The people around the world have come to believe I'm a plant geneticist. I study genes that make plants resistant to disease and tolerant to stress. In recent years, millions of people around the world have come to believe that there's something sinister about genetic modification. Today, I'm going to provide a different perspective. 
First, let me introduce my husband, Raoul. He's an organic farmer. On his farm, he plants a variety of different crops. This is one of the many ecological farming practices he uses to keep his farm healthy. Imagine some of the reactions we get. Really? An organic farmer and a plant geneticist? Can you agree on anything? Well, we can, and it's not difficult, because we have the same goal. We want to help nourish the growing population without further destroying the environment. I believe this is the greatest challenge of our time. Now, genetic modification is not new. Virtually everything we eat has been genetically modified in some manner. Let me give you a few examples. On the left is an image of the ancient ancestor of modern corn. You see a single row of grain that's covered in a hard case. Unless you have a hammer, teosinte isn't good for making tortillas. Now take a look at the ancient ancestor of banana. You can see the large seeds and unappetizing Brussels sprouts, an eggplant, so beautiful. Now to create these varieties, Breeders have used many different genetic techniques over the years. Some of them are quite creative, like mixing two different species together using a process called grafting to create this variety that's half tomato and half potato. Breeders have also used other types of genetic techniques, such as random mutagenesis, which induces uncharacterized mutations into the plants. The rice in the cereal that many of us fed our babies was developed using this approach. Now today, breeders have even more options to choose from. Some of them are extraordinarily precise. I want to give you a couple examples from my own work. I work on rice, which is a staple food for more than half the world's people. Each year, 40% of the potential harvest is lost to pest and disease. For this reason, farmers plant rice varieties that carry genes for resistance. This approach has been used for nearly 100 years. Yet when I started graduate school, no one knew what these genes were. It wasn't until the 1990s that scientists finally uncovered the genetic basis of resistance. In my laboratory, I isolated a gene for immunity to a very serious bacterial disease in Asia and Africa. We found we could engineer the gene into a conventional rice variety that's normally susceptible. And you can see the two leaves on the bottom here are highly resistant to infection. Now, the same month that my laboratory published our discovery on the rice immunity gene, my friend and colleague Dave McKill stopped by my office. He said, 70 million rice farmers are having trouble growing rice. That's because their fields are flooded. And these rice farmers are living on less than $2 a day. Although rice grows well in standing water, most rice varieties will die if they're submerged for more than three days. Flooding is expected to be increasingly problematic as the climate changes. He told me that his graduate student, Kenong Shu, and himself were studying an ancient variety of rice that had an amazing property. It could withstand two weeks of complete submergence. He asked if I would be willing to help them isolate this gene. I said yes. I was very excited because I knew if we were successful, we could potentially help millions of farmers grow rice even when their fields were flooded. Kenong spent 10 years looking for this gene. Then one day he said, come look at this experiment, you've got to see it. I went to the greenhouse and I saw that the conventional variety that was flooded for 18 days had died. But the rice variety that we had genetically engineered with a new gene we had discovered called Sub-1 was alive. Kenong and I were amazed and excited that a single gene could have this dramatic effect. But this is just a greenhouse experiment. 
with this work in the field. Now I'm going to show you a four-month time-lapse video taken at the International Rice Research Institute. Breeders there developed a rice variety carrying the sub-1 gene using another genetic technique called precision breeding. On the left, you can see the sub-1 variety, and on the right is the conventional variety. Both varieties do very well at first, but then the field is flooded for 17 days. You can see the sub-1 variety does great. In fact, it produces three and a half times more grain than the conventional variety. I love this video because it shows the power of plant genetics to help farmers. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. She also goes on to talk about um, rice that has been genetically altered to produce beta carotene, which is an essential nutrient um, from which we get vitamin A because many children in, that are living in poverty, all they can uh, eat, I mean, whatever is provided for them um, is actually just rice. And so if we can give them that beta carotene, which they're lacking in their diet, it can save lives. So this was a, a pro um, GMO video. And then I'm just going to show you part of this one right here. This is actually anti-GMO. Genetically engineered foods have deeply infiltrated the American food supply. Almost 90% of crops like corn, soybeans, canola, and sugar beets grown in the United States are now genetically modified. Genetic engineering promises increased crop yields, lower costs for farmers, and reduced use of herbicides. But are these goals really being achieved? Are you benefiting from genetically engineered crops or paying a dear price for you and your children's future? It's time for an awakening. Learn to separate the truths from the myths on genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is totally different from natural breeding methods. Its promoters claim that genetic engineering is a safe and beneficial process, even going as far as saying that it's an extension of natural plant propagation. The truth, this is a laboratory-based technique where a foreign gene is inserted into the DNA of the plant. This is an uncontrolled process because the site of insertion is random and may potentially damage the plant's genetic makeup. The mutations that occur during the genetic engineering process can lead to many unexpected changes in the resulting crop, such as poor crop performance, alterations in the food's nutritional content, toxic and allergenic effects, and unforeseen harm to the environment. Genetic engineering does not reduce pesticide use. The proliferation of genetically engineered Roundup Ready crops has led to an increase in the amount of pesticides and herbicides used. The allowed residue limit of glyphosate the world's top weed killer, has also been increased. Monsanto promotes Roundup, its glyphosate-based pesticide, as safe and having low toxicity, but these claims are based on outdated and questionable studies. Monsanto Agriculture France was even charged with false advertising after claiming that Roundup is biodegradable and leaves the soil clean after use. Roundup is not biodegradable. In fact, Roundup's glyphosate is classified by the European Union to be dangerous for the environment. Nature always adapts, paving the way for glyphosate-resistant superweeds. This requires the increased use of stronger pesticides. Producers of the genetically engineered seeds benefit from the massive failure because of higher farmer dependence on their toxic chemicals. Genetic engineering does not increase crop yield potential. Okay, so I'm going to stop that one there because some of what they're saying is actually true in that when a crop is, or the plants in a crop, are genetically um, altered so that they resist uh, glyphosate or the Roundup, they're called Roundup Ready, it is true that then that forces um, the use of stronger herbicides or weed killers in order to um, uh, get rid of the weeds okay because some we call any plant that grows in an area that you don't want is really we call that a weed so if it becomes resistant to glyphosate it is true that you would have to use a stronger herbicide in order to kill it and we don't know if there's any residue on plants that have been uh, grown in a crop that are roundup ready because now we're putting a lot of roundup for them but what i want you to do is think about 
These are two opposite sides of the same issue. Although this one seems to say that all, you know, genetically modified organisms are all bad, it could be that there are some that are bad. And it is true that if someone is eating a product that has been genetically modified, um, to produce a protein that could be allergenic to them, yes, they could be um, in danger of having uh, an allergic reaction. Um, but there are other genetic modifications that are not necessarily dangerous. So I'm going to stop right now and I'm going to, this is going to be part one, um, and then I will move on to part two. Before I do it, I just wanted to mention what the field of pharmacogenomics is. And this is um, together with pharmacogenetics. Pharmacogenetics is a study of variations in DNA sequences as related to a drug response. And pharmacogenomics is when that DNA sequencing is applied to the study of genetically influenced variations in drug responses. You may know that some people react to a medication in one way and somebody else reacts quite differently. So that field is actually looking at how their DNA influences how they react to certain medications or drugs. And I will see you on part two.